So I'd like to tell a story, and it might sound a bit familiar. It's about a person, never mind their name, their age, but it's about a person who spent uh, the first part of their drinking life drinking basically shit. Um, they drank party drinks. They drank maybe beer at the, at the, very, at the very best. Uh, and then one day something happened and they discovered bourbon. Maybe uh, they dipped into the bottle of Wild Turkey 101 they, they bought intending to mix it. And they realized it was actually really, really good. Maybe a friend of theirs bought, brought some, um, I don't know, some, some Weller 12 to a party. Uh, maybe, maybe they dipped into their, in their dad's Babel, Basil Hayden's. No, no shame in that. Whatever it was, uh, the, the, flitch, the, the switch was, was flipped. And they started drinking bourbon. And they started to learn more and more, and their palates got better and better, and they started demanding better and better stuff. And they started to grow in their bourbon journey. And uh, they grew so much that they, they began to realize eventually that they were growing away from bourbon. And it also at the same time, bourbon was maybe growing away from them. And, you know, it could be a number of things. Could be maybe, um, maybe they just got tired of, uh, of um, uh, seeing age statements and other objective indications of quality dropping off some of their favorite bottlings. Maybe they got tired of the endless series of limited releases, which they could never, you know, buy, or their friends, you know, and, and the press recommending bottlings uh, that they should check out, which de facto did not exist on the shelves because they were being ripped down. Um, maybe they got tired of, uh, well, seeing um, the people actually making the bourbon, you know, having to go on strike to negotiate a, a decent contract in the midst of the biggest bourbon boom that the industry has ever seen. Or maybe their, their palate just kind of started to grow away from the stuff a little bit, and that's okay. Uh, whatever the case, you know, you, you, you started to, to notice the relationship going sour, and you started to look sideways at other spirits, right? Um, and it's like your, your first relationship, right? It's, this is uh, your first relationship. Everyone kind of knew uh, well, in, well in advance of the fact that things were, were kind of coming to an end, that, that uh, things had seen their best days, and that it was time to, if not cut things off, then maybe open things up, you know, start seeing, um, start seeing other spirits, so to speak. But, you know, there's some fear in that. There's always that, the fear of, of what else is out there, the, the fear that maybe as bad as things are, as, as, uh, as tired as things are getting, and uh, that maybe there's no, just nothing else out there, that nothing will ever be as good. So you, you cling on to the same relationship, the same, same spirit, uh, longer than maybe is warranted, because you don't trust what else is out there, because you never... You never tried, right? Uh, so that's what this video is about is, is okay, you, you're kind of starting to move away from bourbon. What else is out there? What else should you, you be hunting for? It? I will be your, your guide in this. Um, somehow you've stumbled across this, this channel as a video. Hi, welcome. Um, because this is your story, right? The story I just told is probably yours. Um, and that's why I make this video because uh, people, folks like you, probably could use someone to kind of direct them in the in the ways of the world outside of bourbon because there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff out there there's a big wide world of spirits that are delicious and wonderful that are not bourbons and you should be exploring them so i picked out uh, 15 you know i think lightly likely candidates you might want to explore um those bottles themselves but also representing larger categories and also two weirdos which you can explore um if you're you know, and more adventurous, let's say. Let's start out. I mean, if, if you're drinking bourbon whiskey, the, the easiest lateral move is just, just drink a different kinds of whiskey, different kinds of grain-based spirit. Let's start with rye. Rye is the easy one. Um, this, this one I like very much. This is from Few in Evanston, Illinois, so the locals. Um, I like this. This is very, this is not um, uh, an easygoing wood-driven you know, style of rye. This is very cerebral. There's some, there's some uh, uh, 
some citrusy notes in here. There's some um, some weird fermentary uh, notes in here. It's very complex and interesting. Um, definitely something different from from bourbon, but that's what you're looking for, right? This is this is a different thing. You might also consider Canadian whiskey. Here is Weiser's 23, bottled at cast strength of 64.3% alcohol. Everyone has, and, and uh, since I bought this bottle to review it, pretty much the entire rest of the, of the case seems to have just stayed stuck to the shelf as people walk by it to demand, you know, Blanton's uh, or whatever. 23 years old, priced well under 100 bucks, and it's terrific. Um, and nobody cares because it's Canadian whiskey. Still based in, you know, corn and rye, and so it has that commonality with bourbon, but because there's no new oak on this, uh, it has the advantage of aging um, in a much more subtle fashion. It's not taking on those raw woody notes. This is this is all about just, you know, the time of, of, of cask, uh, of, of, you know, air, sort of the cask breathing, of um, slow oxygenation. Uh, this is a great one to try. We could also just try other bourbon. How about that? Tom's Foolery, uh, bottled in Von Bourbon, uh, from Ohio. Sorry. Um, and you might say, oh God, but I've, like, I've tried craft bourbon in the past. Like, I, I bought a bottle of, I don't know, Journeyman or something, and it was god awful. Well, yes, there is some, some terrible craft bourbon out there, but there's also some really good stuff. And if you look on the internet, you will find some guidance on what you should actually be looking at. Um, Tom's Foolery is, is a good one. Pot distilled, which is Mick creates a very different style than, um, you know, the stuff you're getting from Kentucky and Indiana. Um, well worth a look, to, you know, uh, and there's, there's more like it out there. Um, you might also consider exploring whiskeys from, th from, uh, the rest of the world. I think Scotland should be your first, uh, uh, stop. Here's one, which I don't think you necessarily should be buying a bottle of right away. But I mean, hunt down a friend, try it at a bar because this needs to be in your vocabulary. Ardbeg, 10 year old. Uh, you need to have the taste of peaty whiskey in your vocabulary. And in my opinion, Ardbeg 10 is still the, the, the benchmark for the entry level Isla Scotch. Um, so it is impossible to describe exactly what peat tastes like the same way you can't really describe what ginger tastes like without someone actually trying it. It, it just tastes like peat. Um, but what is, what's special about our bag is it doesn't have those, uh, the medicinal notes, the extra, you know, kind of industrial smoky notes of other distilleries. It's a very clean distillate that has this, you know, gets a lot of dessert -y qualities from using ex-bourbon casks, but it just also happens to have a lot of peat on it as well. So very approachable, highly recommended. Um, but for the bourbon drinker, I think actually the safer choice in the scotch would be some, you know, a, a classic sherry bomb, something that's had uh, most, of its, most of its life or most of the, the batch built from old sherry casks. The one I would go with is uh, Ardbeg's neighbor, Bunnehaben, 12-year-old, bottled at 46 point something percent, uh, so stronger than normal. Um, not expensive, this is about 50 bucks these days still. Uh, and a, a very, very good sherry bomb. This is a very good representation of what malt whiskey does in good sherry casks. Um, I mean, you could go out there and try some, you know, high strength blend living and stuff, but frankly, I think if, if you're trying to explore the world of weird wood influence, if you're a bourbon drinker, I think you'll, you'll get more results from ex sherry stuff than, than the, uh, the ex bourbon stuff at first. Like these are things to start with. All right, so let's move on uh, from the world of other whiskeys. Now, if we're gonna move beyond whiskeys, I think the the easiest lateral after that would actually be brandy, um, fruit-based spirits. And let's start with the one your your friends have already probably already told you about, if not try to convince you, can you know convert you to Armagnac. This is the Gros Perrin. Uh, 1996 Armagnac, which was a, a Fine Drams um, aficionado's pick. Uh, this is sadly uh, out of uh, out of stock as of a couple of days ago, I guess. But um, this is a good representation of what you should be looking for. Higher proof. This is bottled not at 40, 
most of the, the entry level Armagnacs are going to be at 40. You, you, some of them are good, some of them are worth, are worth grabbing, but the ones you really want to look for are the ones that are bottled at higher proof, and ideally with uh, with a vintage statement. You get more vintage statements in Armagnac than you do age statements. Don't worry about it, that's just the thing, they're good. Um, very, very woody, but this is, and very, very earthy, because these are just still to lower proof, right, than, than bourbon or most other brandies. Um, uh, but, it, I mean, it, the woodiness and the earthiness is of a different sort than, than bourbon, or any whiskey for that matter. Um, the, partly because the wood they're using is, is French oak. It's, it's Quercus Robur rather than Quercus Ro, uh, Alba, sorry. So you're getting a lot more black pepper. You're getting a lot more dried fruit characteristics. Um, it's, it's oaky, but it's a different kind of oak. Uh, and this is, a, this is a style well worth exploring. Go find some higher proof. You know, ideally vintage statement, uh, Armagnac, they are worth the money. Uh, and they will be worth their money until they get discovered by the rest of the world. Um, uh, you might also consider some Cognac. Um, no, do not buy the bigger brands. Let me repeat that. Do not buy, you know, Remy or Cavossier or Henny or do not, don't, don't buy them. Uh, what you want is something bottled at least a little bit above 40%. Um, that is not made by one of those big names. Um, there aren't a lot of those out there, but they do exist, and you have to hunt them down. So rather than go with the this the um, will be the obvious choice, which which is the uh, Daniel Boyu, which I reviewed in the same video as this little little guy, I'm gonna recommend the uh, uh, Jean Filiou La Fouillade, um, which is a only bottled at 42%, gets much better distribution. Um, and is just a gorgeous spirit. There's a, a lightness, a delicacy to this, a floral touch, while still also being quite, quite wood driven. That I think you know would absolutely kind of kind of just you know, flip some switches for the for the bourbon drinker. This is a, this is a really interesting change. By the way, I should note. I meant to mention this in the in my uh, opening spiel. This video shouldn't be necessarily just for people who want to stop drinking bourbon and go to other things, right? I mean, you can. Ex this is just for maybe exploring other categories. If you just want to, you know, put put the bourbon on pause for a second, go refresh your palate with something else. Like this work, these all work for that too. Uh, anyways, uh, Filio la, la, la Pouillade, very very good um, and widely available. You should be able to find it in most urban areas and probably beyond that too. But France is not the only place that makes really good, uh, really good brandy. You might consider the U.S. and in particular, you might consider Copper and Kings. This is my favorite of theirs that I've had so far. This is their Butcher Town, which was bottled at a glorious 62% alcohol by volume. Um, you again, this is one of those things that people have just walked past as they have demanded, you know, Eagle Rare from <laughs> the poor folks st uh, stocking the shelves. Um, it is probably on your closeout shelf and you haven't even noticed it because it says brandy. It is terrific. Um, uh, there's a mix of American oak going on here. So there's, there are a lot of those classic, you know, bourbon-y characteristics because, you know, of the oak influence. But because the, the underlying distill is grapes, is, you know, basically distilled wine rather than, than um, you know, grain mash, it has an entirely different character, which is really, really refreshing, and I think bourbon nerds would would really get into this. Um, but hey, brandy doesn't necessarily need to be made with grapes, right? There are other fruits out there in the world. Um, and so another one, the last one you might consider is something like Laird's Apple Brandy. This is their single cask selection. I love this stuff. Um, there is a battle going on between the, the oakiness and the appliness in this, which is absolutely seductive, seductive to me. And I'm amazed I haven't sort of destroyed this bottle, the second bottle of mine, uh, yet. Um, it's that good. And I think, just, just to make a kind of side note, if you're looking for the future of American spirits, sort of after maybe someone, everyone gets over their craze, craziness over bourbon, I think brandy might be the place where it goes, um, because America, the U.S. makes a lot of grain. They make more fruit, um, sort of statistically on the on the 
on the world standard. They make way more fruit than almost anyone else. And a lot of it is really good quality, and a lot of it goes to waste. And when there's a lot of waste product, therein there's a chance for distilling and uh, making lots of booze. So my guess is we will see an uptrend in um, uh, U.S. brandy production, and people will make, be making lots of good stuff. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm, I'm imagining this, you know, in the next 10 and 20 years, maybe this, this, these two will be a category to watch. So just to, if you're looking for, to get on the ground floor or something, brandy, American brandy might be it. So let's move these down. So that's uh, uh, this, the most obvious category to go, go, go for beyond, uh, beyond whiskey. Um, you, you, I mean, there are bourbon clubs picking Armagnacs these days. I mean, come on. But there's more out there, right? You might all cons also consider rum. And here is the most obvious choice. Foursquare on Bar Barbados. Uh, this stuff has seen an incredible surgence of, of interest. Like a couple of years ago, this was, this was sitting on the closeout shelves just like, you know, the poor Laird's there. But, um, and the poor butcher town. And now it is, it is at my local shops, it is sitting behind the glass in the spirits case because people want it that much. Uh, prices have crept, crept up from the 60s up to about 90 to 100. Um, is it still worth it? Yeah, it's that good. Um, and most importantly, like this is just an accessible style. It's a vi especially to, you know, ex-bourbon drinkers. Um, all bourbon cask age, so far as I can tell, bottled at very, very high proof. Um, it's old, it's well-made, it's terrific. You can buy Appleton 12 if you want, if you just want, you know, an introduction to woody rum. But I think, I think it's, it's honestly better to just skip straight to this guy. Um, as an alternative, which is maybe a little bit more driven by, by, uh, rum spirit, cane spirit, you might, and then it's a little bit more budget conscious. I would actually recommend Hamilton, uh, 114, so-called Navy strength. This is a blend of column distilled rum from Guyana, which has been um, aged in a hell of a lot of oak, uh, and, a, and there's some very active oak at that, with um, uh, some unaged rum from Jamaica, from Worthy Park Distillery on Jamaica. And it works terrifically. There's a freshness from the unaged rum that just gives this life and this fruity quality to the to the aged stuff, which is which and then turning the aged stuff is, is is cushioning and adding a desserty quality to the to the uh, the pot stilled stuff. It's just a wonderful balance, and it's un available under thirty bucks. This is a crazy value. Um, uh, Ed Hamilton has done a whole bunch of variations on this blend, and they're all good. They're all going to be good. It just works. Um, unaged pot still plus aged column still. It always works. Um, if you want to get a little bit crazier and even a little bit more budget conscious, you might consider Ray and Nephew, Overproof from, from Jamaica. This is also a blend of pot and column distillate, but no oak aging this time. If you want to dip your, no, your, 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 uh, your toes into the water of unaged spirits, um, without spending a whole lot of money. So we'll, we'll get to Mezcal in a second. So that's, that's coming up next. But if you, if you want to spend, you know, 20 to $25 instead of 40 plus, um, consider okay. grabbing this stuff. This is, there is, it's absolutely funky. It's absolutely not bourbon like, but there is a sweetness. There is a confectionery desserty quality to this, which I think will really attract, um, bourbon rickers kind of Again, cushioning the, the the essential complexity going on underneath that delicious, sweetie, desserty quality. Um, all right, so these are the rums. Uh, all of these are worth your consideration, and they might be the most budget-driven category out there, like, with the exception of Foursquare, which is worth exactly the money you're paying for it. <clears throat> Finally, however, we might consider agave. Um, tequila, in my opinion, is a little bit of a hot mess right now. It's, it's still trying to figure itself out. I think I'm hoping the good guys will win and we will see, you know, more tequilas bottled at higher strength, um, less additives, less, but I feel a little bit 
we are you recommending a lot of stuff in that category at the present moment? You, I have some other videos on my channel. You can search for stuff I like, but uh, at the moment, I'm just going to talk about Mezcal. Um, Mezcal, and let's limit it to Oaxaca just to make things simple. Uh, if you want to buy some Mezcal, spend the money. Look for something that says artisanal, uh, Mezcal Artisanal on it um, because that's the good stuff. Uh, there's also Ancestral, Ancestral and Destilado uh, de Agave. Those are, don't worry about those right now. That's for, you know, when you get hooked on this stuff. Um, so for entry level mezcal, I would, I cannot think of better than uh, Alip, the Alipus series. I like all of them. I think the black is my favorite by a hair. The green is also really good. Um, so this is Alipus San Juan. Uh, what you're really looking for is just a, a uh, Espadine agave based mezcal from Oaxaca that's been traditionally made because that combination provides you know a mixture of smoky ashy character with sweetness that I think is absolutely gonna tickle bourbon drinkers happy place um, but in a different way than bourbon does right so this is, the, so this is a great starting point the uh, the Alipus San Juan or the green one whatever the hell the name of that is However, I, I have noticed this is a little bit hard to get hold of these days. Uh, for something with a little bit better distribution, you might consider Vago Espadine. This is uh, by Jarquin. It's a silver label one, or the sort of blue label, whatever the hell this is. Um, also extremely good. Maybe a little hair less smoky, but, you know, uh, uh, trading that in for... You know, a, a, an interesting uh, vegetal fruity complexity that I really enjoy. I will be reviewing this soon. And, and uh, speaking of that, of another mezcal that I will be reviewing soon, um, here is your a last choice, which we might spend, be willing to spend more money on, and which is absolutely worth that money. Uh, Palenqueras Omar Nolasco. So this is uh, another Espadine-based mezcal. And it is one of the most shamelessly delicious things um, I've had from that category in a good long time. Um, well worth the grab, extremely complex, and extremely just, I mean, good. I mean, this is this is kind of a, a little bit of a benchmark, this agave right now, in, in my humble opinion. All right, so that's kind of my list of uh, standard alternatives. Bourbon alternatives, if you like. Actually, that's a good name for this video. I'm going to name this Bourbon Alternatives. Um, but there's other stuff out there, right, that may be, might be a little bit more of a stretch, a little bit more weird. So just to plant seeds, try the stuff I just mentioned that I just set down on the floor there. But, you know, if that starts, if, even that starts to get a little, not boring, but what you start to feel like, I want more, I want more weirdness, here's some other option for you. <clears throat> Going back to rum, so we talked about, everything I, I talked about in rum is, is molasses based so far, but you might also consider some um, cane juice or, or cane syrup based rums. And I can think of no better as a sort of introduction to that category for, for bourbon drinkers than this one, Claren uh, Le Rocher. Um, this is made with um, cane syrup and it, using a Dunder method, pot distilled, very artisanal, from Haiti, uh, extremely good, extremely delicious. Again, the reason I think of using this is because it has a mixture of this really sweet, delicious, desserty quality with this really interesting smoky characteristic that um, is uh, really a powerful alternative to, to mezcals just without getting um, mezcal pricing. But it is a little bit more weird than that, so you know, be forewarned, this may not don't put this first on your list. Just just be aware this is out there and well worth considering. Uh, another alternative, Mar. Um, Mar is pomace brandy. It is not grappa. This is the French stuff, uh, and it's made in a slightly different manner too. Um, uh, this is the Jacques, Jacoulot, Le Petit Mar. I do not like their their authentic uh, very much. The um, the upper level one, but I like this little Petit Mar, and I would recommend it. Um, so it's a pomace brandy, so it has these crazy uh, viney, tea-like, tobacco-like aromatics, but that's all balanced off against the oak. This is Asian French oak, like uh, like Armagnac, like Cognac. Um, 
Uh, and so it's also lightly dosed, which bothers me a little bit, but it's not too bad. I, I would still enjoy a glass of this. Um, very different from anything else here um, and worth your consideration if that's kind of what you're looking for. <clears throat> and uh, that's kind of what I got. That's my list of 15 plus two. The world does not end because the, you know, big name bourbons are no longer available or no longer what they once were or kind of have a bad look to them now. Um, there's other stuff out there and you can find it, you can explore it. All it takes is a little courage on your part, a little willingness to trust and you will find happiness and greater happiness than you have had previously. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. I recommend all of these. I, I enjoy them very much. And um, yeah, I hope this was useful. I hope this was worth watching. Um, and cheers. <laughs>